refuge until men lighten to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, by my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until men lighten to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, by my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until men lighten to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, by my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient all phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata, the cessation of causes as well as taught by the great seer. Om ye dharma hetu prabhava chantathagato yavatat desham chayo nirota evam vati mahashramana yeswaha Om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetum te shantatha gato yavatat te shamchayo niroda evam vati mahashramana yeswaha Om ye dharma hetu prabhava hetum te shantatha gato yavatat te shamchayo niroda evam vati mahashramana yeswaha Okay, uh, we were doing the step number um, four and five now. Four and five. Four and five of the the method of equalizing and exchanging self of, self of others. So this method, step number four and five in Tibetan, combined together is known as the practice of Tonglen. Practice of Tonglen. 
Dom means to give and Len is to take. Give your happiness to others and take the suffering of others upon yourself. Or practice of Dom Men. Okay. Um, the first, the point number seven, the practice of giving, the practice of taking the miseries of others with emphasis on compassion. This is point number four. So here what we do is that um, we take the same, as we breathe in, as we breathe in, this one of the, uh, the say, the, the great saints, they, um, they teach that it is done associated with the breathing. Breathing. And as we breathe in, as we breathe in, we imagine that all the miseries, the pains of the beings, they are being uh, sucked in in the form of, I uh, say, the black water, the dirty torrents of very dirty, polluted waters. Then they, some texts they mention about of the, the creatures, very scary creatures like snakes, scorpions, and so forth. So up to the individual where you, where you, you want to take that in the form of scorpions and so forth, or you take that in the form of very dirty black suit and the, the polluted water and so forth, just gushing in. You just take the miseries for others in the form of uh, this dirty water inside. And as you breathe in through your left nostril, you breathe in. As you breathe in, imagine that all these the miseries, the pains of the beings are sucked in through your left nostril. They just go in, just gushing in. And they go in to, towards your heart where the self-centered attitude resides. And these, the, the, dirt, the, the filth, the dirt, and the, the, all this dirty water, they enter and they fight with the self-centered attitude within your heart and self-centered attitude cleansed and then does all go down and beneath the earth they just go down beneath the earth this is what we visualize and um, how we go about doing this is we can do that in the form of say the miseries of the pain the, the pains and the miseries of sentient beings is of three kinds as we already know the suffering of suffering suffering of change and the pervasive condition suffering so as we take in we take in it in three phases in three in the, the, the three phases. The first one, you take this, the manifest suffering. For example, suffering of sickness, aging, death, the pain of li- the, the losing near and dear ones, depression, stress, and all these sufferings that you can think of. Say, particularly the people, the manifest pain, such as the, the victims in the hands of the terrorists, and also the, say, the, the poor animals in the hand of the hands of the the butchers and so forth. You just take the measures all in the, f- the form of black suit and so forth. Okay, we'll do it. And after this, then we take in the suffering change. Suffering change meaning the the say the bait like the happiness which the, the sentient beings experience, but they trap us. So the bait like nature and the bait. The bait means to, to lure, for example, to cast a fish. Where you, the people use the, the bait, use the bait, and the bait sh- should be delicious. If the bait is not delicious, the fish will not be attracted. So, all what experiences happiness is us to be seen as the bait, and whereas we get attracted, and then we are we are sucked in samsara. So, then the next you take all the suffering change in the form of the bait, very elusive, very the uh, the the what um, deceptive, deceptive, the the bait like suffering change. We just take them. It, that imagine that the beings are freed from the bait like the debate and the deception of this the suffering change. Number two. Number three, then you take in the suffering of the pervasive condition suffering. Number three, pervasive condition suffering. Uh, pervasive condition suffering should be understood in several ways. Okay. Um, the pervasive condition suffering, one is okay, is there anyone who likes to share with us as to what do you understand by Pervasive conditioned suffering. Anyone? 
what, like, what do you understand by pervasive condition of suffering? Anyone? Oftentimes it is also referred to as a condition of suffering. Condition of suffering, pervasive condition of suffering, these two mean the same. Anyone who likes to share with us as to what do you understand by the pervasive condition of suffering? Anyone? Yes, here. Are the suffering, suffering, um, say it again, suffering, suffering as a result, suffering as a result of being under the control of the, the afflictions and contaminated karmas. Okay, very good. Same the suffering in the form of our being under the control. In other words, our being under the control, the fact that we are under the control. Control means we don't have the freedom. Control means we don't have the freedom. Loss of freedom is misery, suffering. So our being under the control of afflictions and contaminated karmas is the pervasive condition suffering. Very good. Our being under the control. Our being under the control or of afflictions and contaminated karmas are being under the control of afflictions and contaminated karmas is the pervasive condition of suffering. Very good. One, then do we, anyone else who would have other? Yes, Tarala? Uh, a fundamental anxiety that prevents us from experiencing love. Oh, your fundamental? Fundamental anxiety which prevents us from experiencing lasting happiness. Okay. Anxiety. Okay, let's say anxiety, it might have maybe several levels. So anxiety per se. Anxiety per se can, uh, it will fall in the category of the, the suffering and suffering, manifest suffering. Because anybody who feels the anxiety um, no, I don't want to have anxiety, right? Whereas the say, other two suffering, the second and third. Second and third category, uh, so people are not aware and oftentimes they like to have it. Second suffering, the suffering change, people like to have it. They don't identify that as suffering. And third one, they are totally oblivious. They have no clue that this is suffering. with anxiety, stress, tension, fear. And then the sickness, aging, death. These are something which we all identify as suffering. So death, the suffering which we all easily identify, including animals, what they identify as suffering. This is the evident suffering or the suffering of suffering, the first one. Now number two, all pleasant experiences. All pleasant experiences which we consider as happiness, not as suffering. All blessing experiences, samsaric, I should qualify that with samsaric. All samsaric blessing experiences, they fall under the suffering of change. Then number three, uh, number three, the pervasive condition of suffering, it has several understanding. So we have to understand all these versions. Number one is, uh, number one is, our being under the sway, our being under the control, our being under the control of afflictions and contaminated karmas is pervasive conditions of suffering one. Number two, in fact, they, I'm going to give you like three of them. You will see that all three are somehow, um, they, they will boil down to the same. Number two, number three, number two is involuntary birth. Involuntary birth in samsara, involuntary birth. In other words, involuntary birth, if you want to make it clearer, involuntary birth in samsara is pervasive condition suffering, number two. Number three is, number three is the neutral samsaric experiences. Neutral samsaric experiences. The painful experiences are suffering of suffering. Then the happy experiences are suffering of change. Then the neutral feelings, samsaric feelings, I should say. Neutral samsaric feelings are pervasive conditioned suffering. Okay, we have to understand in these three forms. Neutral the samsara experiences are by this condition of suffering. Now we need to know why these three are known as why these three are known as pervasive condition suffering. Yes. What do you mean by neutral 
Oh, very good question. Very good. Okay. So the as long as we are in samsara, as long as we are in samsara, um, samsara, and we we don't see emptiness directly. When we see emptiness directly, then only then it becomes very uncontaminated, uncontaminated. When we experience emptiness directly, otherwise, all our experiences on the, the level of the experience, on the level of the feelings, on the level of the experience, or the feelings, is that either we are very we have the excited, happy, or we are sad, unhappy, or, or neutral. Neutral, right? So, the happiness will excite attachment. Unhappiness will excite aversion. And the neutral feeling will excite ignorance, right? With, ne- with neutral feeling, we continue the neutral feeling. We continue to see this as objectively real neutral, right? Objectively real neutral. So that perpetuates our ignorance, the neutral feelings. Okay. Now the next question is how these three forms of these three forms of experiences, or the these three forms classified under the pervasive condition of suffering, how how, how do we, or what makes us to, to qualify them as pervasive conditions suffering? This is a question. Okay, anyone? Let's say involuntary, involuntary birth. Involuntary birth in samsara. So how is this qualified as a pervasive condition suffering? Anyone? It's very important. Sorry? Okay, the question is, why is that known as pervasive and conditioned? Of course, suffering. Why is that known as pervasive, conditioned? Right? Very good. Okay. So pervasive. Pervasive means so samsara. It pervades everywhere in samsara, and samsara everywhere in samsara. Samsara is divided, classified into three groups. What are they? Desire realm, form realm, formless realm, three realms, right? Okay, so, see, the first, the first two sufferings, suffering of suffering and suffering of change, the first two sufferings, they, they, do, not, they do not exist in all, in all areas in samsara. In some samsaric places, the first two pain, the sufferings are not there. So, whereas the third suffering is common to common to all the realms in samsara, all three realms, desire realm, form, form, in all three realms, the third suffering is common. Whereas the first one, for example, to give an example, say the first suffering of the three realms, first suffering, what's the first one? Suffering, the suffering, suffering, the evident suffering, which we consider as evident suffering. So that evident suffering does not exist in the form and the formless realm. It exists only in the desire realm where we are: sickness, aging. Okay, this is a good question. Aging. Okay, aging. Does it exist in the form and the formless? Aging. Yes. Right. Aging exists there. So aging is the the the, uh, the evident suffering, suffering, suffering. So suffering, suffering is in the form realm also, but the text says that no, it doesn't exist there in the form realm. Okay, let's say aging. With the aging, we have the man, the unhappiness. Whereas this unhappiness, the physical aging is one thing. Physical aging, and in our case, in our case, with the physical aging, what happens? The say the very tender skin, the tender body, healthy body. Um, the, the, the tender tender skin becomes more and more rough. And the very healthy body becomes more and more fragile. Right? And then eventually uh, it decays and dies. Whereas with the form the formless, same the but the form, but in the form, the body is there. But the body it does not it does not decay like this from oh, what is so attractive to what what is it is forever attractive. It does not change from the attractive to the unattractive. This doesn't happen in the form realm. So what we call as aging is what is, what is attractive, healthy, changes to unattractive and unhealthy. 
right? So this is what we call as aging. That is, that makes the pain. From what do you think? If your body, so when was your body the fittest, healthiest? When you were 16 years old, 15 years old, right? If that body forever remains like this, very healthy, right? Very fragile, no, but agile, right? Flexible, the body forever it remains like this for the next one, say you're like 80 or 90 years, right? Forever it remains like this, then you wouldn't really worry about the aging, right? You may worry about the death, not about the aging. But we worry about the aging because our body, which is so flexible, healthy, slowly it turns towards the very rigid, right? And then uh, the loss of strength, and then it becomes very, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the bristol, even the, the bones. Right? Young children, it's very strange. The bones are very flexible. That very young children, age, I think four, five, six, once a young girl was cycling in the, the clip, cycling, and somebody, another lady was driving the car, and the lady might be a new driver, right? And the, the cycle, his car, and the car was coming, and the cycle was also going towards the car, the car was also going towards the cycle, right? And both are new, I don't know. <laughs> then they hit, and the, the young girl, fought, they fell, and the car continued to run. And the, the car ran over the girl's belly, and the car was not, not just a very tiny small car, it is a standard car. And the girl, the other, the, the lady who was driving, for sure was a new, a new driver. Still, she could not come out. Finally, before she came out, the girl already stood up and started running. <laughs> you can't believe that. For people like us, our age, if somebody, and then for sure, some bones are already broken. Because the bones are very flexible for the, for the young. It's very flexible like plastic. So it's just dent and then it comes out, right? Whereas as you go, grow older, then the, the bones, if hits, it's very bristol. It cracks, right? Okay, so um, the, the pain of sickness, aging, death, and so forth, which are under the category of suffering of suffering, it only exists in the desire realm, not in the form in the formless realm, the first suffering. Now the second suffering, what is the second suffering? Suffering change. It exists only in the desire realm and in the form realm. The two not, not all the four, the, the form realm is further divided into four. Formless into further divided into form. So the form, it, ex it, does, it exists, second suffering exists in the form, the first, the first concentration, the four form realms are known as first concentration form realm, second concentration form realm, third concentration form realm, and the fourth concentration form realm. So it exists only in the first, second, third, not in the fourth. Suffering will change. And formless, it doesn't have. So therefore, the first two suffering, they are not pervasive. They don't pervade the entire samsara. They exist, they exist only in some places. So whereas the third one exists all throughout, all across the board of samsara. Form realm, the desire realm, form realm, formless realm. The third suffering exists in all three realms. So because of which, this third kind of suffering is known as pervasive conditioned suffering. Right? Uh, for example, like involuntary, involuntary taking birth, involuntary birth in samsara, that happens in all three realms. One. Number two, they are being under the sway of, are being under the control of the afflictions and contaminant karmas. It exists in all three realms. And then the neutral feelings, neutral samsaric feelings. Neutral samsaric feelings exist in all three realms. Right? Whereas the, with the three feelings, now tell me, you can now uh, tell me. And the, of the three feelings, what are the three kinds of feeling, feeling, three kinds of feeling that we can have? Feeling of pain, pleasure, and neutral. Pain, pleasure, and neutral. Okay, let uh, please tell me. Feeling of pain, where does it exist in the three realms? Where does it exist? Feeling of pain, desire realm. What about form realm? Feeling desire, feeling pain. No, it does not exist in the form of formless realm. Now, what is the second feeling? 
a pleasant feeling. Pleasant or happy feeling. Let's say pleasant feeling exists where? Pleasant samsaric, of course we're talking about the, 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 the contaminated. Contaminated pleasant feeling, where does it exist? Which of the three realms it exists? In desire realm? And the, the first three concentrations of the of the form realm. Very good. Okay. It does not exist where? The pleasant feeling, pleasant, conta contaminated pleasant feeling does not exist where? It does, it does not exist in the form realm, the fourth, fourth concentration form realm and formless realm, right? Okay. Very good. Then the third one is the neutral feeling, contaminated neutral feeling. Contaminated neutral feeling exists where? in all three realms equally, right? So therefore, because it exists in all three realms, it is known as pervasive. It pervades all the samsaric realms, pervasive conditions of suffering. Okay, so uh, with this, now when we take the suffering of others onto you, you can do it in three phases. First, you take all the evident suffering, or suffering, suffering, suffering in the form of black suit, the, 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 the current, in a very gushing form of the, the very dirty water with black suit and so forth. You just suck in through your left nostril. Okay, so we'll do this um, three times. Three times, then we'll do the suffering change, then the obvious condition suffering. Okay, ready? So this, this is no, this practice and the second one which we're going to do Combined together is known as the practice of Tong Len. This is so famous, this is very popular in the, the, the Tibetan tradition. <clears throat> okay, let's do that. Let's, okay, we can, if possible, um, you can think of the, precisely think of the, the pains which you have seen with your own eyes. With your own eyes. For example, say the pain of the, the victims, um, the so who, with the victims who are dying, the pains of the no, the people who are dying in the hospices, hospitals, and so forth, and <clears throat> the pains of the victims in the hands of the terrorists, the pains of the animals in the the, the slaughterhouse, and so forth. So those things we can just be creatively think about these things and wholeheartedly suck them through your left nostrils and they go through your heart and at the heart your self-centered attitude is residing there and then they actually consume the self-centered attitude and then they go down and they down the, the earth just way down and your self-centered attitude is consumed and all the evident suffering of the sentient beings are also they gone and then you just rejoice in seeing that now the sentient beings they're all freed from the suffering of suffering okay let's do that three times As you do this, if you feel a little bit of, say, I say uneasiness when it enters into your, towards your heart and then consuming the self-centered attitude there, there's something is being eaten up within you. So if, if you feel a little uneasy, a little bit of, uh, say, the, oh yeah, uneasiness, um, effect is being felt effect of this practice in placement. This is so good that you're feeling on Actually, it's uneasiness because that we feel that I, the self-centered attitude, actually who is feeling uneasy, uneasiness, uneasy, is the self-centered attitude. Because it's being consumed by this, then you feel a little uneasy, oh, what is this? No, I'm being, this. so now all the bad things go into me, and then it's eating up what is inside. So there, when it feel a little uneasy, or I say a little, of fear and so forth, this is considered very auspicious because the self-centered attitude, who is actually talking, saying, I'm, uh, is very, is uh, the very traumatic. So this is the self-centered attitude talking. So self-centered attitude is being undermined because of this practice. Okay. Next, we 
take in the suffering of change. Suffering change in the aspect of being vicious. The pleasant feelings being so vicious. And the same if the what do you call that? The um, the animals, the trap, the uh, in the, the wilderness, the animals were being. They they keep the traps to to catch the animals, right? The traps. Same in the traps, they put some food, and the deer and these animals go there, and they eat, and then they are trapped. Now, if this deer somehow could escape from this trap. Will the deer be once again trapped there? No. Knowing that this food is nothing but to trap me, the deer will never go close there. Right? So although the food per se is good, but this food, it traps the deer there. So because of which, the deer once knows that this uh, trap will never go towards the food, although this is delicious for the deer. The, the deer. Likewise, all the pleasant experiences, right? All the pleasant, if you think very carefully about impermanence, suffering, so forth, then we see that these pleasant experiences are the one which really traps us, which really kept us in samsara, where we go through the miseries endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. Okay, the more we think about this, then we, the more we see the viciousness or the bait the pleasant feelings as being the bait for our existence in samsara. Okay, so we try to take all these, the, the bait like the suffering of change from all sentient beings and you imagine that now the beings are freed from the deception of the, the suffering of change. Okay, let's take this three times. Next, we take the pervasive conditioned suffering in the form of um, the, our being under the force of afflictions and contaminated karmas. Afflictions and contaminated karmas. Just taking all these, the, the beings being so vulnerable, the beings, all the beings, sentient beings, they're being so vulnerable because of the contaminated karmas and the and the afflictions. So this vulnerability, you take all the vulnerabilities and imagine they are now freed from the control of the afflictions and the contaminant karmas. Okay. And then in the, the process, as you breathe out, imagine that the actual fight is happening. So these, they consume. So at times, it would be good if you can visualize in the form of actually the, the snakes and the scorpions and so forth just entering. And then they are really struggling there, fighting with the self-centered attitude because the, the snakes and these, if something is going inside and then the, you could feel it, it's very scary. Okay, so feeling of the, okay, now something, I'm being eaten up or I'm being... That this feeling comes to you, then uh, actually the self-centered attitude is being undermined. So the whole purpose is to undermine our self-centered attitude. Okay, let's do it through this three times. good so with this um, in fact I personally I personally this much just sharing and um, very likely is more common experience with all of us here um, I think in my 20s of course during the, the teenage then the 20s I think even in 30s maybe early 30s um, just seeing the snakes and the, this uh, there's a feeling, a little bit of, say, the feeling of uneasiness, something, even the body, 
as though like I'm done now, <laughs> right? Some, this kind of feeling used to come to me, come to me, and uh, this is, if not hundred percent, say eighty percent of the people is much more the same. It's much more the same. Now, um, if we practice, if we practice compassion, seeing that I am suffering. They're also suffering. I want happiness. I want, okay, under heat, I need AC. They also need, say, pleasant, let's say, a good temperature. They also need that. And uh, on top of that, um, I can, we can more, the human beings, we can get food and so forth more easily. But for them, it's a great challenge. And they're so vulnerable. The more we think about that we are equal, and yet they are so vulnerable, right? They are so vulnerable. Uh, the more we think about the, the plight of their pain and so forth, and then we see them very equal. And then the, the next steps that we are learning, as particularly step number um, seven. Step number seven, we learned that step. And then, of course, the step one and two, which we already learned, that by cherishing, the more I cherish others, like including the insects, animals, and so forth, the more I cherish others, the more I reap the benefit. I want wealth. I don't want to suffer poverty. So this wealth is coming by generosity. Generous, generosity is possible only if there is someone who to receive generosity. If there is no one to receive generosity, where, I, where, where am I going to practice generosity? Without generosity, where am I going to get the wealth in the future lives? Right? So, and then likewise, I want to say, have a favorable birth. And the favorable birth is the result of not harming others. The discipline, the morality of not harming others. And... Not to, harm, not to harm others, there should be a scenario, there should be a situation where you can potentially harm others and then you deliberately refrain yourself from harming others, right? So that is, there should be others there. Without others, I cannot practice this. It is only because of the presence of others that I can practice this and it is on the basis of which I can have a favorable result in the future of the, the human life and so forth. And likewise, the, I want to have a nice look. I want to have um, the radiance in my appearance. And this is because of the presence of the patients. And the patients, after presence of patients, only with same, if um, same, say by some accident, if some, something falls from the, and hit me, and a human being hits me, I'll be so angry if a human being hit me. Whereas if naturally if something falls and it hits me, I don't mind. It's so biased. So that way, we see that, that we can lose our patience. We become angry towards the sentient beings. Not as much to the natural disasters, right? It was ascension based. Now, only with the practice of patience, you can have the radiance in your appearance. And I want radiance, right? While in samsara, I want to have this radiance, right? So for this, if I really want this, it is only through practice of patience. Practice of patience is possible only with encountering with the other sentient beings there, right? Without the sentient beings, how can you practice patience? In fact, just to share with you one thing, that um, that one point I was in a retreat, in a, I was in a retreat, and there everything I cook, there is no wastage there. There's no wastage there. Everything I cook, say for, I peel off the onion, even the onion, the peels, they're so precious for me because all these peels will go into one container, container, and of course, something which is really eatable, like rice, these things, if left, that's even better. They go there. And the, even the, the onion peels, something which otherwise usually is totally going to waste, they all go there. And what I do is that, that um, these, then on top of that, the cabbage, fresh cabbage, I would chop into pieces, mix them with all the onion things, and add a little bit of the salt to this. And then there outside, there were cows there, cows roaming around. Then I would give each one of them a handful of this thing. They would love it. They would love it. The moment the next time they saw me, they would start to run towards me. 
<laughs> right? They love it. So I was so happy that nothing go waste. All the cows, they really enjoy this. Everything they enjoy. I was so happy that nothing is going waste and everybody, something, whatever is left there is of use for someone. So good. Now in Delhi, oh, terrible. Something which we can actually, even the human beings can eat, and then say, my friends, they give me, say something, the samba like this, like this, and somebody gives me ten, and I cannot give it to anyone. That nobody is this kind of thing. They are the way Tibetan area people eat, but in Delhi, the young Tibetans they don't don't really eat these things. Samba is a roasted barley, roasted barley. They don't eat. And then it gets stacked like this, and then I have no place to. And finally, after about like one one month, I have to throw this. So whereas if this were in the in that place, this the poor my friend cows, they would be so happy to enjoy this, right? Everything goes ways. Okay, so with this, um, the same the. The practice in order to practice generosity to feel the joy to feel the joy of the practice there should be these you know the the animals there or the other sentient beings should be there without the sentient beings i cannot practice this generosity this even the ways they go they become so they are not waste at all they are so useful so we see that all these practices what gives me happiness is all because of the virtuous karma and this virtuous karma they are somehow connected with the sentient beings in the absence of the sentient beings, I can't engage in these virtuous karmas. Without the virtuous karmas, I cannot reap the benefit of all these experiences. So therefore, the sentient beings are so kind, so kind, right? They don't want to come and say, hey, no, Dorji, you want help. No, we, they, they, it's not necessary. They have to come like this. The fact that, finally, it's better that I have to engage in virtues. That is what reaps the, gives us the happiness in the future. And that is all because only if the sentient beings are there, Right? And for example, the practice of patience, say, with your parents, with your, your family members, that is a real place where you can practice patience. Practice patience. With the patience, then what happens, the, the result is that you will have the radiance in your future lives. So again, we see that there's a great opportunity for us to practice patience. And practice of patience is because, and practice of patience, there are so many other results also. Not only the radiance, there are so many other results. So this is all coming because of the kindness of the presence of the sentient beings there. Right? Okay. So with this, we see that, that it is through the sheer kindness of the sentient beings that we can practice all these six perfections and because of which we can reap what we want. Okay. So with this, the same, the taking the suffering of all sentient beings on yourself. One. Now the next is um, number five. Giving your happiness to others with emphasis on loving kindness. Giving happiness to others with emphasis on loving kindness. So this can this will be done. This will be done in four ways. Four ways. Giving happiness. Giving happiness is generosity, and generosity of four kinds: generosity of material material resources, generosity of material resources. Number one. Number two is generosity of affection, love and affection. Number two. Number three is generosity of generosity of protection. Number three is generosity of protection. Number four is the generosity of dharma. Okay, generosity of material material resources, generosity of love and affection, generosity of protection, and generosity of dharma. Okay, four generosity. Dharma, dharma. Okay. Now, first, when we do when we do the first one, generosity of say generosity of the material resources. Imagine all the, say, the poor beings, the animals, the human beings, those who are really deprived of material resources, as they, who are deprived of, they say, the health, medical, medical health care, who are de- deprived of food, who are de- deprived of the facilities for education, who are deprived of, say, the, so the house, shelter, and so forth. Which, and then, if you can think of, if you think of the very specific places in Singapore or wherever uh, you have been, if you can think of, this, uh, sometimes there are the shelters, say the cancer patient shelters for the very 
the uh, poor children. In fact, it's amazing. In India, there's one group. Well, one of my friends who is, who is a Newsweek journalist, and he and uh, some of his friends, they came together and created a um, cancer shelter for cancer patient shelter for the poor children. Poor children, it was all for free, all for free, and it was just amazing. I went there, I think, twice. Amazing. So they set up the centers in various places because the the place uh, these patients get treat, treatment. Um, they get the treatment treatment free from Indian, the Indian Government Hospital, Ames in Delhi. But the, the thing is that it's not just the treatment. They have to come all the way from the village to to the to Delhi. And once you enter Delhi, it's so expensive. And they're going to stay in the first place. And often some of them do not have any do not have any financial let's say support. And because of which that just to travel, just to travel, and they have to sell their whatever property that they have, the small property that they have, they sell from the village. No, nothing is there in the, the village. Nothing is there. With a little money, they then buy the tickets for the two parents and the young young child. And sometimes if there are two or three children, one is suffering from cancer, even the other two children, they have to come. Because the parents, uh, without the parents, the children cannot survive. And there nobody is there to take care of them. So they all come. And then they have to buy these tickets. And all this money comes from this selling the property. So once the child is in the hospital, then where are they going to live? This problem. So seeing all these problems, then this group, amazing group, amazing. It is constituted of this, my friend, who is the Newsweek journalist, and uh, one very prominent, the I think cardiologist, cardiologist, very highly prominent, the highly, the what, renowned uh, cardiologist, and likewise some the from the corporates, some like-minded people, very generous, compassionate people, they come together and form this center, seeing this problem, this is amazing, amazing. And then um, they, they rent big houses and they, they just convert that into the cancer centers. And then, so they, of course there are conditions there, conditions there because they should, the, is it, it's with the human life, human life, coming with the terminal illness. So they have to, they are responsible. Once they invite them, they should be responsible for it. It's a huge responsibility. It's very dangerous as well. Very dangerous also. So the condition, the late condition that both the parents should be there because anything happens to the child, the parents should be taking the responsibility because it's a huge thing. People can sue. And uh, okay, so many things, complications. So with this, still, they took the responsibility that the center is probably running. And now they have several centers around Delhi, around Delhi. So as long as they can come, they can come to Delhi and report to them. Then once they're reported, then they're taken care of. Their food, they stay, everything is taken care of and the medical is taken care of by the Indian government. And on top of that, once you come in contact with this group, so this group will make sure that you get a good treatment from the Indian government hospital. Right? Otherwise, you go on your own, nobody, nobody will take care of you. So that way, it's amazing. So what I'm saying is that there are wonderful things happening there. And so now in those places, when you see the see the young children, very young children, suffering from cancer, dead cancer, this cancer, and so forth. When you see this situation, it's very pathetic, very pathetic. So, whatever situation that you have seen in your own life, or you've heard, you bring, to, bring them, bring them into this kind of, say, in this meditation. First, those who are materially poor, materially poor, what have you experienced, what have you seen, and uh, you can bring them in this meditation. And uh, so that's very good. That's very good practice. So you practice this, and then when you actually go out, when you're out of the meditation, then you see in what way you can be of some help, practically some help to these groups, 
these groups or the people, individual people or the groups or whatever. So see how much we can be of help while see the, the main the exercise is done during the meditation session and then the actual implementation see if you can do that when you come out to the practice see what you can do for these things okay so with this for the practice of giving your happiness to others with emphasis on loving kindness so there if possible you can invoke all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and visualize all the sentient beings and the first one Generosity of the material resources. Just think, think of those who are deprived of medical facilities, and then just lying on the road, and they have nothing to do, and they just have to survive. In Delhi, for example, the temperature shoots up to like 46, 47, and to wake, they they hardly get any drinking water. See. At times, one one time I saw that in a newspaper, a son and a mother. And the son was, I think, already in his 20s. And only the mother was there to take care of the son. And the, the son was suffering from cancer. And uh, no, no place to stay. No place to stay. So, um, the, if the mother goes out, the son will be left, left alone on the road. Right? So the mother has to be there. If the mother stays there, who is going to give them water, food, and these things? Terrible situation. So like that, there are so many of these things are there, and these are facts. These these things are facts, and yet, by these, by thinking about these things, if you have not seen them, by thinking about these things, it may make you break down. It may make you break down. Still, still, what you do is that it should be done very carefully. Done be very carefully. So okay, first we theoretically we try to learn this, right, and then practically. Uh, how should we deal with the situation in case if we on the verge to say they break down and then we feel so demoralized feel so low by thinking about this the reality of the life or the sentient beings okay so how to deal with these things we can discuss later for the time being let's finish this the the these uh, the five don't know the four uh, the four ways of taking the no giving you happiness to others okay first the giving your generosity of mutual resources okay sit upright properly and while we we think of and in fact the, the material resource is the result of um, the practice of the generosity of material resources to others so even if you may not have as much material resources but if you have the say the causes of the material resources so your kindness your wishing to help others you wishing to help others of the material resources within whatever capacity that you can of you can be of so even these causes they are actually like the material resources in its in its say, causal state in its causal state you can give them you can give them right and you may not have any material resources to give as yet, but you can think of the virtues you, the, all the virtues that you have generated. These virtues can manifest in the form of the material resources. So these you are giving. So with this, you think of, you think, make it so real, make it so real, particularly those uh, whom you have actually seen or heard who are suffering from the material, the deprivation of the material resources, then for them, imagine as you breathe out, as you breathe out, imagine that all your virtues, all the material resources that you have, on the virtues that you have, they all go through your, they all flow through your right nostril in the form of the white nectars and the white, the lights, in all directions, the mere touch of these lights and the nectars with the bodies of the, the beings who are deprived of the material resources, all these virtues and the things, they transform into whatever requirement these the others have, like the medical facilities or the food, shelter or the education, material resources, so forth. They transform with them and they relieve from the poverty. Okay, this is what we do. Um, three times.
what you're very good. Number two is the generosity of love and affection. Love and affection. Oftentimes, people are deprived of love and affection. Love and affection. For example, when people go through depression and stress. Depression. Uh, say, when one is a little depressed and stressed, this person may not be so appealing to you. You see that, oh, what? He's not talking to me. She's not talking to me. What happened? Right? Did I do something wrong? And you also don't like to, to talk to the person. Actually, the person is going through difficult times. When somebody is going through difficult times, how can the person smile at you? Right? Yet we don't understand this. We think that the person is angry towards me. And then you, you deprive the person of love and affection even more. Right? So we think it in a very, also more in a holistic way, more in a holistic way to see to the situation, putting yourself in the shoes of that person. Right? So that way, oftentimes what happens is that when a person goes through little di difficult times, then um, people around, they don't understand the person. They think that this person is a little arrogant today or a little rude today because the person did not greet me today. Usually he greets me, she greets me. Today he didn't do it. He's a little rude. Or did I do something bad to him? Okay, I don't care. Then I'll not talk to him also. Right? Actually, the person might be going through very difficult times. So when the person going through difficult times, this is when your love and affection should exceptionally, especially it should go to embrace the person. Right? Now we are doing the opposite. We are doing the opposite because, because you don't know the situation there, you think that the person is being a little nasty, rude to you, and then you cut off from the person. Then it makes the person even more hurt and sad. Right? Now you think of all those people who are going through depression, stress, tension, sadness, the sadness over the loss of near and dear ones, sadness over one's own difficult the situation so far. You think of these people. And say, for example, people in the, hands of, in the hands of the terrorists. Say, the animals in the hands of the, the butchers, and so forth. And then imagine that you are releasing them. You are giving them love and affection. You are giving love and affection. And even the butchers, they also deserve love and affection. Because of their ignorance that they engage in this. And perhaps this is the only choice that they have for their livelihood. Right? And then imagine that you can be very creative. Imagine that you are giving some money to the butcher, telling them that you, you release these animals, and then you also don't work like this. I'll give you some other work. Like this, be very creative. And or you the, connect the butcher to some other people who can give more jobs to this butcher like this. You just release everyone out of love and affection, particularly who are totally just drained into stress tension, depression, so forth, you go there and give love and console the person. Okay, so again, as we breathe out, we breathe out the nectars and resutan, and all the love and affection that we have, they flow in the form of, say, very soothing light and they light and nectars through your right nostril, they just spread, spread, spread throughout the space and they, they touch as they touch those beings who are deprived of love and affection they imagine that you manifest themselves you manifest these, these lights manifest in the form of yourself yourself in front of these people and then giving love affection caring consoling counseling all these things doing so affectionately so selflessly so affectionately the way the mother does to the child okay this is what we should be doing Okay, three times. So with this, um, practically speaking, we need to keep in mind that, say, the people who are very sick and uh, who are going through such a mental the stress, tension, and so forth, the first thing they need is love and affection. The first thing that, need, that they need is love and affection. And one, 
and likewise the your parents now they are already aged what they want from you the first thing that they want from you is love and affection this is so important okay in fact this is what i share with the same oftentimes in the retreats same and there was a father and a daughter and the daughter got married was in america and the father was in um they say taiwan and the daughter visits the father once a year and um the same after getting married then the daughter was not knowing um say going to meet the father visit the father and going to spend uh, time there what kind of gift i should take and then she could not think of anything then coming there she became so desperate and she get, just gave 300 dollars us dollars to the father and the father was so so happy he was in what he, he he just he just got the feeling as though like he was in heaven the 3000 300 dollars he was so happy the father was so happy this is a gift from my daughter 300 dollars right okay tell me what is that thing which the father was so happy about the gift or what okay this you will know then the the daughter after one month she was written, she was to go back and live in america then the father gave gave her 7000 us dollars <laughs> okay tell me now Now tell me what was that thing which made the father so so excited so so happy what is that? what is that the three three hundred dollars or the love and affection from the daughter love and affection from the daughter not the three hundred dollars if it's three hundred dollars he may give one hundred dollars to the daughter not seven thousand dollars right so the fact that this is coming from her daughter means it's is simply the reflection of the daughter's affection to the father he was so so happy and then this another anecdote very touching the the father mother and the daughter and daughter was very young and she was sent to school and the daughter would send a christmas card to the the parents to the parents and then the the father right the christmas card um received from his daughter how he would touch it how he would open it even cutting make sure that the envelope is not not um the what spoiled cut in such a nice way then read the the card inside and the card just kept as so holy precious and then afterwards after one or two days um the card is always visible in front of his eyes in front of his eyes and then one day he was asking the the wife in fact the wife told me at one time the also what where's the envelope we usually throw the envelope we just put the card he is not just happy with the card he we need to have the envelope to make sure the envelope is not in the dustbin where's the envelope and then the, the wife was so hesitant where's the, the envelope so she was busy looking for the envelope right and then finally she gave it to him and he just treasured it as so like it's um, the diamond so precious so tell me why is why was he doing that because that reflects his daughter's love and affection that is so precious for the parents for the parents the greatest gift okay i'm speaking i'm generally speaking 80 the 90% of the parents the greatest gift that you can give is love and affection more than the material resources sometimes material resources can be like a medium through which the parents can ref- see that as the light of your love and affection what if they really love with, the, with what they really crave from you is your love and affection that is so precious so keep in mind that oh hey dad you should do like this mom you should do like this no you are not doing properly no now time is gone right your job is to give love and affection because we never know how long you're going to go how long you're going to be together and when you're very young when you're very young right when you're very young particularly when we are like age 1 2 3 there was no rule 
just, okay, so you can do whatever you like, right? Including the, what, the, uh, the potty, everything coming out, right? You can release potty wherever you like, and the mother is so kind to do everything for you. Now when they grow older, when they need your help, you are creating all the rules on them. Right? This should not be done. It should be done like this. It should be done like this. No. Right? Now what they like, we never know how long we are going to be with your parents. Right? And the amount of love that we, that we have received from the parents. Particularly when we needed them the most. In fact, that my experience there in Malaysia, just recently with that, the mother holding the baby, just a few weeks old baby, that is good enough for me. That if I have my parents still with me, I would make sure that I will not create any rules to them. Whatever they like, do, please do, right? Be happy, right? And even if I would be so busy, so tired coming home, the first thing I will do to them is show a smile to make them happy. Look at uh, how vulnerable you are when we are just like one week, two weeks, three weeks, so vulnerable. Nobody in this world knows the present that you're born on this earth. On your mother and your father, right? They see you as the, the most precious thing in this universe, right? With this amount of care, love given to you. And if you're okay, this, this girl, this son, when she grows 16, 17, she'll fight with me. Okay. <laughs> right? The moment she does like this, finish. We can't do anything. We can't even cry to cry for, say, I'm, I'm feeling hot. I'm feeling too hot. Please wrap me. Please give me the, the word, the, under the air con. You can't even say this, right? I'm a little hungry. Please give me food. You can't even say this, right? You can't talk and easily eat you up. But the fact that we're all very strong and healthy today is all because of this amount of love they've received from the mother, the father that we're able to survive this strong. And then we've forgotten that. And then you, you become slowly, you become the age, say, uh, 16, 17, 18. Oh, my mother is so deep, possessive. My mother is so protective. And then this and that and so forth. And then you reach age, age like 25, you start working. Then 30, and you become very established, 30, 40. And then you start dictating on your parents, hey, do this and do that. Hey, you, you already, you are not a child. Still, you, don't, you can't even do like this. At least this is the basic, the basic norm, basic courtesy, right? You are dictating all these things and the how. Imagine, if they don't get love from you, from where will they expect love and affection? Just imagine. When you are young, if you did not expect love from, if you cannot expect love from your, the, the, the one who is taking care of you so much, from where you are going to, to expect love and affection? From nowhere. Now is the time for them. It is for them to expect love and affection from you. From nowhere else they are going to get love and affection. Right? They already feel that they are already redundant in the community. Now we will say that nobody is going to take them. Now if you don't take care of them, if you don't give love to them, uh, who is going to give love to them? The one who has given you love when you need it the most, right? So this is what we have to face, very serious thing. Don't think that things should be proper, right? Hey dad, mom, make sure that things are very proper. No, for them the first thing that your job to do is to make them happy, right? And things may not be as perfect, don't worry. Okay, this is so important. Okay. With this, the, the second part is giving love and affection towards the, the people who are deprived of love and affection, number two. Number three is the generosity of protection. Generosity of protection, giving protection to the beings. Okay, this, for this, what we knew, do is, for example, say, like the, um, say, okay, fortunately, I'm very happy this time. I was going to, I was thinking that coming to this jumpy, very holy place, holy, very holy place where once so many practitioners, they actually practice bodhicitta. And this very teaching of the bodhicitta, which now we receive from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, inherited from this place, Indonesia, particularly Jambi. Okay, once, thousand years ago, the great teacher, Bodhisattva Lama Selingpa, and then his students, 
and maybe wandering around, going around here and there, giving teachings to people. Must have happened. Amazing. But today, today, I thought that, okay, India, the land of the Buddha, and then from, say, one place to the other place, when you go, you could see all the poor chickens being carried in trucks. Poor chickens. Okay, it's just so draining your energy to see the poor chickens being carried from one, and then trapped in the, the cage for people to buy, right? Uh, it's very saddening. And I thought that, okay, so Indonesia, no doubt I will see the same sight. Although I'm going there, we are going there um, to visit, to have on this very holy land, but sure, I was going. But fortunately, I don't know whether it exists or not, exists. I don't know. Fortunately, I did not see any of this, 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 this sight. Fortunately, this was something I was so fascinated that coming from the airport to the here, right? And then going to the, uh, what, Morajambi, going there, coming back. I did not really see, uh, I was, sometimes I was seeing the big truck. I was now, oh, maybe now this could be the one. Then finally, it's nice that it was not like this. Oh, that is something so auspicious on this holy land, on this holy land, once so many people, practitioners, literally practice bodhicitta, literally practice bodhicitta, uh, the practice of Tonglen, they did this here, in this place. And I'm very happy that in this place, at least to my side, I did not get sight of any, got sight of any of such things. Okay. So, now we just imagine, say, the, the generosity of protection. Imagine the, say, the the, the poor chickens in the KFC and the poor animals in the slaughterhouse. Just imagine. So there what we do is that as we as we take as we give your as we give as we give do the practice of the giving, the nectars and the light go out and then they they go there and they manifest in the form of your own appearance. Your own appearance and same the in the all the, the chickens them, you release them and imagine that they meet with their own, you know, the say the, the chickens, their mothers like this, have a reunion happening and they are freed in the say they are freed in the sanctuary and then in the slaughterhouse again the same thing. All the what do you call that? What is the the, the, the baby calves? Calves, right? The calves oh, oh. So what is that? The there's the special meat of the calf. What do you call that? Huh? Veal. 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 Okay. So say, uh, say the, the the calves and the mother calves they're all separated, right? Separated, and they were just gone into the next. Okay. Just imagine that because of this, you go there. And you release, you free all of them, you free all of them, and then again the calves and the the mother, they reunite, and again you release them into the sanctuaries, right? Sanctuaries. And then say the people in the, the hands of the terrorists, imagine that that you release them, you release them through any means, and then they reunite with the family. Just imagine the amount of the joy that the people feel. Right, the the victim feels, the relatives of the victim feel feel the enormity of the joy. Just you give this joy to them by releasing all the people who are suffering, who are suffering the fear of death, really by releasing them. Imagine they meet with them parents, they meet with their children, they meet with their family members, they are so happy once more. Okay, this is how we should be creative. Okay. Um, let's do this three times. <clears throat> Okay, now if 
it is okay for you if it is not too much if it is not too much okay be very careful be very careful if it's not too much then sometimes in order to to crush the self-centered attitude in order to crush the self-centered attitude what we can also do is what we can also do is that imagine that imagine okay in australia in australia um i was in a i was in a restaurant and in the restaurant there was one what what do you call it aquarium aquarium i don't know but it's aquarium huh? fish tank yeah there's the fish tank there and i thought that in india whenever i saw the this fish tank it was aquarium very beautiful right so at that time i felt a little uneasy it was not at all beautiful right it's a say a small tank with a glass and the fish was so big it can hardly move there and the crabs very big crabs were there I, no, if it is, um, yeah, it seems to be a good, a good restaurant, good restaurant, and if it's for the the beauty, aesthetics, and for the entertainment, it should be, it should look, it doesn't look nice, right? It doesn't look nice. So I was just wondering, this thought never came to me, the bad thought never came to me. I thought because in India, we. I, at least I do not see I do not see anything of that sort in India. In India, everything is so beautiful. The, the small fish there with the what the electric with the lights and the water bubble coming there, oxygen, everything is like this. So this is so this is very different. No, there's no appeal there. If it is for the appeal, please remove this. It's not really appealing, right? Something is wrong. Then still I could not solve the problem. The puzzle was not solved. Then the, the cook came. And then I asked the cook, what is this? And the cook was shocked to see that somebody is asking this question to him. <laughs> and I was shocked the answer that he gave me. Cook said, for eating. Oh. And then, that's very true, after a few minutes, the cook came and picked up one of the crabs and went to the kitchen. So what is this crab going to do? For sure it's going, going to go into the, the, the hot oil. Right? Okay. So understand me. If it is all right for you, right? I'm again. Don't do it. But if you think you can do it, try this. If it's too much, don't do it. Do it slowly. Right? Okay. Imagine. Imagine that a cook picks up the crab and is on the verge to throw this into the hot oil. Right? Now, just in the exercise, mental exercise of this giving protection to the life of the crab. Now you imagine, you can imagine that you, you talk to the, the cook, please release this crab, don't throw it there, please release the crab in the ocean where it came from, please release the crab. No, 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 so this is my business. If you really want to do a business, if you really have to kill someone, if you really have to kill someone, let me jump into this. Let me jump, release this, and let me jump there, and you, you, you kill me, right? And do like this, and then imagine that you are jumping there, jumping there to release, to free this crap. Do this, and then what will you feel? <sighs> this feeling will come to you, right? Now I'm finished. Okay, this thought, when this thought comes, what is happening is that your self-centered attitude is attacked. Right? That is attacked. Whereas, if you do like this, and then the, for, for the next two, three days, you feel so lost like this, then don't do it. For the time, don't do it. For the time, do it. Don't do it. Just imagine that you are paying some money to the cook and release the crab. That's fine. <laughs> no need to jump into the, the <laughs> yourself. Right? Whereas, whereas, if it is okay for you, if it is okay for you, where, where you can visualize this and then you don't mind. Fine, let me die. Let me die as long as the crab is freed. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. In this, since time immemorial till now, I've been killing others all the time for my safety. Now, for the first time, I get the opportunity to free someone else and me dying to free someone else is amazing. I never did it before. This is a great opportunity. I'm doing it. 
right? So you do it like this. So there, what happens? And slowly, slowly, then earlier you see the cramps. It's little. What do you? How do you describe describe this feeling? Huh? The, your, the hair standing on your body when you see the, the crabs or the, the snakes or whatever, right? So now when you do this exercise, slowly that, that uneasy feeling will disappear. When you see the crabs, your compassion will flow. When you see the snakes, your compassion will flow. Rather than feeling the, 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 what, the hair standing on end, then feeling the, a feeling of running away from this, right? Instead of that, a feeling of compassion flows. And that is an amazing practice, amazing practice. But as I said earlier, if you think that this is too much, right, then uh, don't do it. Instead, do it in a more gentle way. Imagine that you give money to the cook and the cook releases the crab and the crab goes into the ocean the crab meets with her with his or her say parents and they're so happy around right or meet with her children they're so be happy so just be creative okay uh, this is uh, to be done now the next number four number four is the practice of the, the giving of dharma generosity of dharma okay generosity of dharma again to be done in four ways. And you know, the Dharma itself done in four ways. Okay. One, you know, so Dharma means now after, say, giving them the material resources, now they don't have to worry about the, 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 the food, the health, and so forth. Now, giving the love, right, they feel rejuvenated. You rejuvenated, giving them the, the protection, right? They feel so safe. Now, I don't worry about anything. Now, the food, everything taken care of, then I'm, I feel so energetic because I get the love and affection from others. Then I don't have to be afraid of my the, the losing my life. Now I'm perfectly all right. So they, then what? Then the next comes to really, so these are the temporary benefits. Now the ultimate benefit, the real benefit is to exterminate the two demons from that being, to exterminate, to, to put them to the ultimate happiness. So, so far it's the temporary happiness. Now to put them into the ultimate happiness. To put them the ultimate happiness, it is, it cannot, you cannot do anything from externally. To give the ultimate happiness, what should you do? Of the two hands, two hands, the sound of the, the clam of the two hands. It is only through letting them pull out the internal factor, one hand. And then with the external factor, however strong, the sound of the misery is stop. This is the ultimate way of giving them the happiness. Ultimate happiness, right? For, for that purpose, you have to teach how to pull one hand. You cannot give extra things to make them ultimate happiness. Nothing can be done. It is only through teaching them how to pull the internal factor of the two demons, how to pull down the two demons, and then with the two demons pulled down, then with the external factors, however strong, even if somebody throws you into the, the oil, the, fresh, the, the burning oil, you will not be affected. Right? So this is the ultimate happiness. So ultimate happiness can be done by only teaching them how to eradicate their two demons. You're getting it? To eradicate the two demons, you have to teach them only by giving the wisdom to how to eradicate the two demons. So that is done by in form you I do that with the four steps. I do that with the four steps. Right? Even Dharma. Generally speaking, okay, just imagine you are teaching Dharma like this. So I do that with four steps to make it very clear. Right? The first one is the Dharma of renunciation. Number two is the Dharma of the Bodhicitta. Number three is the Dharma of the Wisdom of Emptiness. Right? Then number four is the Dharma of the Union of Bliss and Emptiness. Right? Union of bliss and emptiness. One is renunciation, bodhicitta, wisdom of emptiness, and the union of bliss and emptiness. So, the single pointed meditation, single pointed meditation, shamatha meditation is included in the union of bliss and emptiness and also in the wisdom. You can make them inclusive within these two. Okay. The dharma of renunciation, dharma of bodhicitta, the dharma of the wisdom of emptiness emptiness and the dharma of union of bliss and emptiness okay 
First, let me explain quickly what these four are, the term of renunciation. Um, is the term of renunciation is actually what the same we engage in actions. We engage in actions. Ordinary people engage in actions. And the Bodhisattvas also engage in actions. The Arahats, Shirvaka and Pradik Buddha Arahats, they usually refrain from actions. You're getting it? Okay, let me create three scenarios. Ordinary people like us, we're so active. One. Then the Arahats, they slow down the activity. They slow down the activities. They are more so calm. Then the, the then we go to the Bodhisattvas, Bodhisattvas once more so active. You're getting it? Ordinary people are so active. And the other huts, Shiravagas, Pratikabhuts, who see personal impression, they tone down the... When, once they were ordinary people, once they were ordinary people, then they tone down, they, they, they cut down on the, the activeness. They become more calm. Then you go to the next, next phase. What is the next phase? Bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas, they become once again very active. You're getting it? Okay. So now who are, who are the, the beings who are so active? Ordinary beings and the Bodhisattvas, not the Shirvagas in between, right? Although these two are so active, these two are very different in being active. Ordinary people, they are so active, driven by self-centered attitude. And Bodhisattvas are so active, driven by other cherished mind. This is difference. And the Shirvakas, the Shirvakas, because this is so self, I am more important than others, and this is not with the Shravakas, so they tone down this activity. And because they don't have the other cherished mind as much as the Bodhisattvas, they are not so active in the other way also. So they are more calm, calm, right? Calm meaning less active, inactive. So simply they go into their personal practice, that's it. Okay, now let's see. Ordinary beings, they are so active driven by acute self-centered attitude acute self-centered attitude so this acute self-centered attitude makes them to accumulate so much of the negative karmas yes no yes no good now because that who are these ordinary beings in some other galaxies we are the ones we are the ones so what we should do is that first we have to stop we have to stop all these actions, active actions, driven by self-centered attitude. We have to stop that, right? How to stop that is, is by practicing renunciation, right? Practicing renunciation. For example, the teaching of the four seals. Hey, don't think of, don't think of engaging the corruption, right? Corruption, you are trying to think of getting billions of dollars. But your life is so sharp, you can't even use one million dollars in your life. Right? So what are you going to do with all these things? When you die, you're going to leave everything. So things are impermanent. When impermanence is taught, many of the misdeeds are stopped, automatically stopped. And then things are of misery, the nature of the misery. As long as we are under the contamination, we all we go through the miseries, right? Then what we see as happiness, they're actually of the, the, the misery nature. So that way, we see that many of the things for which we are so obsessively going there, right? Okay, so all these, the unnecessary, meaningless things will be cut down. So we see that first we have to cut down our, say, negative karma's accumulation with the practice of the renunciation. So first, as we breathe out, as we breathe out, imagine that, imagine that the nectar and very sweet lights go to us all the sentient beings, and then the, when they touch the beings, then these nectars, they manifest in the form of yourself, in the form of yourself, in innumerable manifestations, and imagine that you are teaching them the four seals, that you are teaching them how to renounce the miseries, how to renounce the contempt, negative karmas, and so forth. This is what we do. Okay. Okay, first we will write them. Right? Number one. Number two is number two is the generosity, the generosity of the bodhicitta dharma. Right now, once they stop engaging in the negative karmas, negative actions, negative actions, then you teach them how to act in a virtuous way, driven by, driven by bodhicitta, driven by cherishing others. 
So then you teach them about bodhicitta. You teach them, teach them about the six practice of six perfections, practice of ten perfections, and make them once more very active into virtuous activities. Number two, you teach bodhicitta. So with the, the first with the first the teaching of the renunciation, what happens is that they stop engaging all the negative karmas. Stopping the negative karmas, what happens? They stop experience they stop experiencing all the the suffering of suffering. Right? First, because they cut from engaging the negative karmas, they stop experiencing the suffering of suffering. You getting it? They stop experiencing the suffering of suffering. You save them from the suffering of suffering by teaching them about the renunciation. Then in the second phase, when you teach bodhicitta, then what happens? Suffering, suffering stops and bodhicitta increases their happiness. When somebody has the bodhicitta, it's so appealing. The feeling of the, 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 feeling of the, the happiness that you get is transcendental. It's transcendental. So with the practice of bodhicitta, you teach about bodhicitta, you teach the perfect six perfections, ten perfections, so forth. And then you, because of the practice of bodhicitta, they gain, they attain the happiness which they've never experienced before. Right? Very pure happiness. There's, you, there's abundance of happiness that they're experiencing, number two. Then number three is the wisdom of emptiness. Now, what actually, what actually the severs, what actually severs the samsaric experience is by the wisdom of emptiness. Then you, let's say number three is you give them the teaching on the emptiness so that then, then at that point, when you uh, so in each of these things, you know, in, you know, each of these things, when we meditate, for with, for example, with this one, emptiness. When you give the wisdom emptiness, so the, the light and nectars flow through your right nostril, and they spread, they touch the beings. The moment they touch the beings, they manifest in the form of yourself, or you know. In fact, yourself would be much better. Yourself, and then imagine you are teaching them emptiness. And then, when you imagine that you are teaching emptiness, you have to quickly retrieve what emptiness is. Just the feel of the emptiness within you, just the feel of the emptiness, feel of the emptiness. Physiologically, you feel that that the disturbance, mental agitation, disturbance slows down and quells and the very uh, very serene experience comes to you very serene experience comes to you wow it's amazing how i wish that the beings should know this all the sentient beings they should know this then i will teach them this wisdom of emptiness so that they will experience this bliss within them right then you imagine that you are teaching wisdom of emptiness and then imagine that they're all experiencing this the bliss that you have experienced now that you experienced now Okay, then finally, number four. What is number four? Number four? The union of bliss and emptiness. This is more into Tantra. This is more into Tantra. So to give you a gist of this, to give you a gist of this, is that as we discussed earlier, as we discussed earlier, um, say, what degree of actions, what degree of actions are driven by what percentage, what percentage of the actions are driven by the feelings? Huh? If not 100%, 99% of all actions are driven by the feelings. You're getting it? Okay. So now, imagine that because of the practice of bodhicitta, because of the practice of bodhicitta, you, you reach to a level, you reach to a level whereby, whereby, you have the experience of happiness, the bliss, 24-7. Imagine, 24-7. 24-7, right? 24-7, that too triggered by bodhicitta, right? So do you, would you like to have this experience of bliss and happiness 24-7? How many of you like to have it? We all like to have it. Okay. If we like to have it, this is only possible if we have, if we have, the bodhicitta as the driving force. So, if we start to have it, we should be feeling grateful to what? Grateful to the practice of 
bodhicitta, right? And bodhicitta is possible because of the kindness of the sentient beings. Only if the sentient beings are there, you can cultivate the bodhicitta. If not, bodhicitta is not possible. Without the bodhicitta, experiencing 24-7 happiness and bliss is impossible. What we really seek is experiencing bliss and happiness for 24-7. And that is possible only with the bodhicitta as the driving force, which in turn is possible only with the kindness of the sentient beings. You're getting it? So from this we see that even the happiness that I'm getting is because of the sentient beings. Even the 24-7. Same. In fact, when you reach to that level, they, if somebody slaps you, even this slap, you will feel the bliss and happiness. And we, will, we may not, we may not be believe in this. Right? And if somebody cuts your body, you will feel the bliss and happiness. So that too, not from tantric point of view, in from the sutra point of view, when you reach the part of seeing, when you reach the part of seeing, somebody cuts your body, right? Instead of pain, we'll feel the bliss and happiness. And in tantra, the experience is much more intense, right? So this all because of the driving force of the bodhicitta, bodhicitta having the bodhicitta as the driving force. Okay, with this, when you experience this, then what happens? The, the bliss and happiness that you have becomes even more expansive or more intense the more you engage in the bodhisattva activities. You're getting it? So therefore, we see that this bliss and emptiness are amazingly, this is what we are all seeking, yet we can be trapped by this. Just as, just as the, just as what? Suffering of change. Suffering change is a bait, right? It's a trap. Likewise, this can trap us. Now, how to make sure that this does not trap us? Because of the wisdom union of the bliss and emptiness, right? So imagine that you're experiencing this bliss, 24-7 bliss and happiness. And with this experience of happiness, this you have to literally meditate, right? You have to just experience that you're experiencing this bliss, 24-7 bliss. And this bliss is also empty. That when you, see, you, when you see that this bliss is empty in nature, empty in nature, empty of your existence, instantly, again, another layer of peace will come to you. Another layer of very profound peace will come to you. Very profound peace will come to you. Wow, amazing. So with this, there's a tremendous vast peace there, the vast happiness there, bliss there, and yet not trapped that even that is also illusion-like. Again, you will take to another level of the very profound experience of emptiness, profound experience of bliss, right? So there, there's no danger of getting trapped and that you're forever having this. The more you experience the merry emptiness of that bliss, another bliss comes, right? And that, because you're seeing the emptiness, you are not trapped. It's amazing. You have 24-7 bliss and happiness and tranquility, very serene bliss and happiness. At the same time, not getting trapped because of the wisdom. Amazing. This is so precious. How good would it be that each and every dear mother sentient being, they experience this. Then you, you know, imagine that you are teaching this to all sentient beings, the union of the bliss and emptiness. For this, first you have to see, you have to make sure that uh, this uh, a similitude, a facsimile, a facsimile, a, a, something similar to the, the real bliss and emptiness. Of course, we cannot have it now, but imagine that we can have just facsimile of that experience, that same, when you meet with the mother after so long, what's the experience like? So joyous happiness. So this joy and happiness, see the emptiness with this, and then what's the next experience? It's even more happy, even more tranquil, even more peaceful, even more, say, freedom. So this, then you share with all sentient beings. This is known as the generosity of the dharma, of the union of bliss and emptiness. Okay, um, we're going to do this, all these four together now, right? Okay. So this is pertaining to the, is the part of the practice of giving you happiness with emphasis on loving kindness and giving you happiness, which is of four kinds, material resources, love and affection, then the protection, then finally the dhamma, giving dharma. So giving dharma is further consists of four. So this is what we're going to do. The first one is the renunciation. Number two, renun with the renunciation, the outcome should be that the beings are free from the same 
the what the first kind of suffering, the suffering of suffering. Then next with the bodhicitta, not only they they don't have the suffering suffering now because of the bodhicitta, they have a tremendous happiness and joy. Bodhicitta. Then with the wisdom of emptiness, not only they have the joy and the the no miseries, but the miseries is cut from the root by the wisdom of emptiness. Then finally, what we all see, what everyone sees, is the say 24/7 bliss and happiness which does not trap us. That is the union of place and emptiness. Okay. Are you ready? Given the dharma of the renunciation. feel the joy of all the sentient beings being freed from the accumulation of contaminated car- the negative karmas because of the teaching on the renunciation now they're experiencing the freedom from the suffering of suffering they now feel so peaceful happy no more suffering suffering no more sickness aging death misery tension lamentation and so forth Next the term the, the, the gen- generosity of giving the dharma of bodhicitta. With this practice, you are given tremendous joy because of the, the, the bodhicitta that they are practicing now, which you have taught them how to practice it. Now they experience abundance of happiness. Next, the practice of the wisdom of emptiness to let them cut the suffering altogether, cut the samsara altogether three times. Abidance experience that they're experiencing emptiness now. You also experience it. Now all the sentient beings, they are, they are totally freed from samsara altogether, totally freed from self grasping things altogether. And finally, the union, the bliss and emptiness. <coughs> okay, quickly just try to experience the union of the bliss and emptiness. First by invoking that tremendous joy that you, that you get out of meeting of mother after 10 years of separation where your mother was so keen to meet you and she was kidnapped by someone and you were so keen to see your mother free and the mother so keen to meet you and after 10 years finally you meet her the first moment imagine tremendous joy just invoke that experience Now you imagine that you experience the emptiness of this joy. So this experience of joy, this joy, imagine that you're experiencing, experiencing it for, say, say one minute, experiencing this happiness for one minute. This one minute experience of happiness, the tremendous joy, is made of 60 moments, each with one second duration. And if you if you are actually experiencing this joy, it should be the present moment. Experiencing means the present moment, not what you experienced, not what you were experiencing, what you are experiencing, what no, what you will experience, only what you are experiencing. If you are experiencing something as a joy, 
it should not be more than one second because all these 60 one minute is divided into 60 seconds and the 60 seconds though don't they don't arise simultaneously they arise only sequentially when the first moment is there the remaining 59 moments seconds are the moments are yet to come when you experience the second one the first one is gone the remaining 48 is 50 58 is yet to arise in that way what you are really experiencing if you are experiencing something it should not be more than one second even one second experience of this joy even that is composed of 1000 millisecond duration of joy so the first moment of the first moment of the one millisecond of the happiness when you experience that the remaining 999 experience the moments are yet to come when you experience the second the first one is gone the remaining 998 is yet to arise so with this we so it becomes smaller 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 then suddenly it becomes very short duration very short duration that you can't really experience it okay now what earlier you saw as i'm experiencing tremendous joy of meeting my mother this is just like an illusion what you're really experiencing is one millisecond of a mind one millisecond of mind is so fast that you cannot possibly experience what you earlier thought you were experiencing was just an illusion. So what, what you earlier thought you were experiencing simply disappears. Like the flower disappearing when you go into the atoms. With this, there's no danger that, you can be, that you'll be trapped by this joy of, the tremendous joy of meeting with the mother. This is known as the union of the bliss and emptiness in a facsimile form. Okay, now send this to all sentient beings. Teach this to all sentient beings. Okay, do it three times. Slowly come out of the meditation. Okay, so this constitutes what is known as the practice of Tonglen. And be mindful that some people they do this practice, Tonglen practice exclusively the Tonglen practice. What I would suggest is that if possible, don't do the Tonglen practice separately. Always do it in conjunction with the earlier with the earlier three method the three steps early three steps because if you do the tonglen exclusively the danger is that you will feel the burnout you will you will have a burnout feeling too much i cannot do it anymore whereas whereas if you do it in conjunction with the first three steps you will never experience the burnout feeling you will never experience burnout feeling you will become forever more energetic forever more energetic Right, one time, um, the same somebody invited me to one place in Oroville, one place in India, for um, to give some same lectures. So, the the host came to pick me up from the airport. Then on the way, on the way, we were just discussing, and the host was asking several questions to me, and about Tonglen and so forth. And then I just warned the host that. If possible, don't do the Tonglen practice separately. Do it in conjunction with the, the all the nine steps, at least with the first three steps. Otherwise, you will feel, you, at one point, you may feel that this is too much, I cannot bear it anymore, right? And then the host said it exactly the same. She said that, yes, you are right. I've been doing this for some time. Then at one point, I cannot do it anymore. I cannot bear it anymore. I cannot take the suffering. It's too overwhelming, right? Whereas, whereas if you do this in conjunction with the first three, this problem is never there. So therefore, say when you meet with some teachers who may teach just the Tonglen, right? It doesn't mean that they, the teacher does not know how to 
the need of the first three steps. You learn this from the teacher, but your, your job is you must incorporate this with the first three steps as well. And if you want to try, you can try exclusively and see that you burn out, right? <laughs> and then you will see that, yes, he's right, right? Doing that with the first three steps will never make you tired, will never make you overwhelmed, will never make you the, say what, will never make you a burnout. Because Pong and practice is where you are giving everything to others and you are taking measures on or to yourself. And you have not, you have not, you, are, you did not see the demerit of cherishing the self. Because of this, self-cherishing is intact with you. And self-cherishing will always talk to you saying that this is too much for you. Don't do this practice. So that will be manifested in the form of you feeling overwhelmed by this practice. Whereas with the first three methods, first few steps, you've already crushed the self-centered attitude. You've already crushed the self-centered attitude with the first three methods. So the self-centered attitude does not have any say now. Because of you, which you do the practice and there's no one to tell you that this is overwhelming and you don't feel overwhelmed. This is an incredible skilled practice to incorporate the first three steps with this. And then, the particularly, we have done what? Step five, step six, step seven. Step seven is exceptionally powerful to make this tone and practice even more, even more, I'll say, lively, even more rigorous without feeling overwhelmed. So all these steps must be followed. Don't jump to step number um, four and five directly, right? Otherwise, you may break down. Okay, I think we'll stop here.